Hey y'all, I've got awesome stuff for you today. Over this last week, I've been on three different penguin surveying trips, so this is going to be kind of a mashed collection of pictures and videos and everything from those. So what do I mean when I say a penguin survey trip? We're looking for penguins. That's exactly what we're doing. We're going out, we're trying to find their burrows and stick cameras on them so that we know what they're doing, how they're behaving. And particularly what we're looking for with these cameras is parental attendance time. So how often is each parent attending to the chicks or to the eggs? Uh, the way we know that, whenever a penguin walks into the burrow, the camera notes there's motion, takes a picture, and we're like, ooh, that's a penguin walking in, that's a penguin walking out. And based on that, you can take the timestamp from the picture and just uh, say, hey, this penguin arrived at 7 o'clock and it left at 9. Or the other penguin came out at 9, based on whether there was two in there at the time or whatever. Yeah. So it gives us a good indication of parental attendance time instead of just saying they're noting, penguin left at 7, penguin arrived at 9. So we just have a camera with a timestamp on it. It does the work for us. So we're trying to get 10 cameras out to each of four different sites so that we can get tons of data on how often the crew are attending to their babies. So what do we do on these trips? How specifically do we go about doing all that stuff? So first thing we have to do is plan. Because you can't just go out there and say, I'm going to find a crew today. That's not going to work. Um, you have to be there at the right time. You have to be there at the time of the year that they're going to be using their nests. So generally for Kuroa, that's going to be like August to January is the best times to find them because that's when either um, they're getting ready to lay their eggs, they've laid their eggs and they're sitting on them, or their chicks have just hatched and they're take care taking care of them, or they're going into molt, which means they're losing all their feathers and growing new ones. Uh, they do that every year so that they can have prime, healthy, waterproofed feathers. So those months will be basically the only times they have a good chance of seeing them. Uh, out on the water, if you're out on a boat, you might see some crora swimming along, or whenever you see like a really dense school of fish, and you'll see them like split apart randomly. It's probably because a crora went shooting in between them trying to grab some of those fish. Yeah. So first thing is planning what time you're going to go, and then specifically once you've gotten it down past the month, you have to have the tides correct so you can actually walk around the area. If you show up and it's high tide, you're waiting four, five, six hours until the tides are lower and you're actually able to walk around the area and start to find those burrows. So we plan ahead what day is best to go uh, as far as the tides and then what time on that day will be the best for the tides. Because if the low tide is you know 6 a.m. or 9 p.m., well, we probably shouldn't be doing it in the dark. So we have to wait for a day that the low tide is hitting that perfect point where we get a good full day to be out there uh, doing our work. And then we head out there. Uh, these three trips over the last week have been to Tafer Nui, but we also have the other sites, Otata Mutuihe, uh, Pokihinu, and Teritori Matangi. Yeah, so we plan around that. How long does it take to get out there? Pokihinu, it's quite the journey. It's an hour and a half drive, and then maybe like two, three hours on the boat, depending on how rough the waters are. Tafer Nui is relatively accessible, just being about an hour, hour and a half drive out there. But then you're hiking an hour or an hour and a half or as they say here in Aotearoa, tramping, hiking is tramping, um, out to the site, depending on which point you're going to. So like one of the trips, we started along this stretch of beach along the south part of the peninsula, and that's just leaving from the first car park right at the beginning of the peninsula. But then we have other sites way down at the end, and we don't even get anything done until we've gone all the way to the end of the peninsula. So that's quite the long walk, usually through mud, usually over rocks. Um, it's not a pleasant, easy stroll. Yeah. And particularly walking along the beach. So if we have to wait for low tide to be able to walk along these stretches, that tells us that they're going to be wet, they're going to be covered in barnacles, they're going to be slippery, it's going to be hard walking along it. And we've been checking the health app on our phones that tracks steps and uh, stairs climbed and all those things, and they're usually pretty impressive. Uh, one day was like 16 kilometers, another was 14, another was 15, and all of them are at least like 50 or so flights of stairs climbed, which is a pretty tall skyscraper. It's like climbing that and then walking your 15 kilometers. So very, very tiring days. And we walk that whole thing very slowly because of the next part, we're looking for the burrows. But before that, when I said the other day that there's nothing dangerous here in Aotearoa, I was just thinking of land at the time. Along the water, there's definitely some dangerous things, and one caught us off guard. I'm going to put up a picture right here. What do you think in this picture could injure us? Cliffs could, the water could, but we take precautions for both of those on the cliffs. You know, we've got climbing gloves and uh, we're, you know, trying to keep three limbs on the rocks at any given time. The water, strong swimmers always go in pairs or more. And same thing, try not to get into the water, try not to fall. But what you're probably not seeing in this picture is a fur seal. Even when I tell you, you're still not seeing it, I'm betting. Uh, I couldn't see it because that stack of rocks right there looked like a perfect penguin habitat. And I was walking towards it and uh, Carrie, who is out on that trip with me, just kind of shouts me, oh! 
there's a fur seal there, don't go close to it. And I still couldn't see what she was talking about. So we kind of skirt along the cliff and go up with it to the side, and then I take a, a look on the better camera, and sure enough, there's a fur seal there. They're called seals, but they're technically sea lions. Um, a bit of a misnomer there. But yeah, that would be really bad to walk up to one, because they are very, very dangerous. Um, so you have to be careful on them. They're pretty slow, and they can't climb that well, and that's why we went up the cliff. But they can be dangerous if you walk up to them, which I very nearly did, because it was being very sneaky. So we do have to be aware on that. We don't want to do that or fall into the water, because there are sharks. Generally, sharks won't cause any trouble, but you just don't want to risk it. Don't get in the water if you don't have to. Yeah, so now we're looking for penguin burrows. Once we've safely walked along the beach and not angered any fur seals, how do you find a penguin burrow? Do you dig up every single inch of the peninsula or the island? No. The first thing we do is look for anywhere that looks penguiny. That is the official scientific term for it. It's a penguiny area. And generally what that means is it's not bare rock faces. There's usually some soil they can dig into, but not always. Um, and usually there's some vegetation that kind of hides them. Usually it's a pretty gradual slope because they can't go up a super steep slope. Again, usually, because we found some, like I said, we found some in caves, we found some up very steep slopes that we did a um, controlled slide <laughs> getting back down the hill, more, you know, crashed and fell and luckily didn't get injured, but we're going to be very careful from now on on that one, <laughs> going a different approach route. Um, yeah, so we look for anywhere that looks kind of penguiny, and the whole time we're just looking up at the cliffs, or sometimes those rock stacks, looking for anywhere that p could potentially have Cordora in them. And then, the best part, we try to find the poop. Because everyone poops, especially Corora, because birds can't control when they do their business, it just kind of comes out when it's ready to go out. Uh, yeah, and because like flying birds, it's going to fall a long distance and it's going to be just a splatter. Penguins of all sorts, and especially Corora because they're so short, um, it kind of sprays. It's kind of like a little spray outwards. Uh, it's a very distinct poop mark. And we try to find those. Anywhere we see a bunch of it, there probably is a Corora coming ashore. Sometimes they try to trick us by having the little spots they just come ashore and hang out. Not totally sure why they do that, I guess. Just to hang out instead of nest. But sometimes they'll throw us off with that. We're looking for a burrow and the whole time they were just like, you know, standing on a rock for a night or two and leaving behind their marks. Yeah, so we try to find poop, particularly if it's leading in a trail. That kind of tells us which direction they were headed, and we can follow that. Sometimes if we're really lucky and it's a sandy beach, we can follow their footsteps. But that's dependent on the tides, and it's dependent on if there's sand on that beach. And most of them are rocky, so there's only one, you know, one or two segments of Tafra Nui that we can actually go by the footprints. And they're really distinct, and it's pretty adorable, because Corora footprints, they're, you know, little three-claw prints, but the really distinct one that gives away that it's a Corora as opposed to anything else is they trip all the time, they just trip and fall. And whenever they do, they leave this little skid mark from wherever they fell on the sand. So it's really difficult to misidentify a Corora print because that's pretty distinct to have a little skid mark in your in your footprints. Yeah, so we try to find the poop, find a, try to find footprints if that's possible, and we follow that trail. And then once we get up to the cliff area, um, possibly into the vegetation, we look for penguin trails. And so that's a little trail in the vegetation about this wide. Sometimes we get thrown off by really old human-made trails but it's just some knocked down grass, some pushed aside plants, anything like that, that sort of looks like they've been Corora walking up and down that trail. And we follow that, and once we've identified a place that looks pretty likely, there's poop, there might be footprints, there might be a trail, then we just kind of fan out and look for any holes in the ground. But their favorite spots are under Pohutakawa trees, and those are the Aotearoa Christmas trees, because Christmas is in the summer here, and we don't really have like the normal uh, I think it's usually a fir tree for Christmas trees. Uh, don't have those here. So Pohutakawa is a Christmas tree here, and they're really great for penguins to build their nests in. They usually excavate out under the roots and build this nice little nest in there. But sometimes they also hide under flax, which is a really common plant in a lot of these islands and peninsulas, or between rocks in caves, uh, particularly some really deep caves, and they always have to be above the high tide mark so that, you know, the nest doesn't get flooded in. So we're looking for anything that could potentially be a little crevice, cave, burrow, tunnel, something that the Corolla has been going through. Particularly if we see feathers or more poop in that burrow, then we know there have been some Corolla using it. And then once you've identified that likely burrow, the best part, you can really smell when, <laughs> when there's one in there or they've recently been using it. Sometimes we get thrown off by the stench of a dead animal, and that tells you a lot about what it smells like whenever there's a Corolla in there. It doesn't smell pleasant, but it's a very distinct smell. 
and it's a dead giveaway that either it's currently being used or it's very recently been used. So that pretty much confirms to us there's something in here we really have to take a look. Sometimes we'll have all those other signs, there's poop trails, there's walking trails, there's footprints, something like that. But then we take a look in and it doesn't smell, that pretty much tells us it's not been used. So if we're pretty sure one's in there, first we get our little head torch and we take a look in, do we see any flashes of blue, any feathers, any eyes, anything like that? A lot of them are pretty deep tunnels and caves, so we can't always get a great look. In that case, we break out the burrow scope. So the burrow scope is this like snaking camera thing, kind of like if you've ever seen plumbers use something similar to that. And we just push it through, and at the end, it's got a little night vision camera feeding it through the cave, feeding it through the cave, and hopefully we see Cora down at the end of the tunnel. And particularly, if we can kind of wedge the camera up under them, we'll be able to see whether it's an egg or a chick. And that's the last part of what we're trying to find out about them. So we want to be sure it's a penguin cave, we want to be sure it's a Corora cave, and then we want to find out, is there just one in there, or is there two? Are they sitting on eggs, or are they sitting on chicks? Or are they just hanging out? If they're just hanging out, we're probably concerned. Either they're about to lay their eggs, or they're molting, but if molting isn't in the proper season, that could mean that uh, the Corora is sick, something like that. So that would be something of concern. Um, or they're getting ready to lay the eggs, which about now would be pretty late for them, and that might also be a problem but uh, um, it could just be, you know, they were late arrivals. And then once we've confirmed, okay, there's a Corora in there, it's sitting on two eggs, there's only one, which means the other one is out at sea foraging, what do we do now? We need to be able to find it again. So break out the phone or the better GPS device, get the GPS coordinates for it, go to Google Maps or Here Maps or any other app that we can just take a screenshot and say, okay, this is where we are on the map. We've got that and the GPS coordinates. And then we take pictures, because sometimes these are really well-hidden burrows, and having the map isn't going to be enough to find it. So you have to take a picture looking out to the sea that says, okay, this is the view you have when you're standing right in front of the burrow, and then turn around, take a picture in front of the burrow, this is what it looks like, look in this area. So we get all that information, be able to find the burrow again, uh, write down all the data, we'd say, um, natural burrow 14, two penguins sitting in it, two eggs at this date, that sort of information. If we can collect any feathers that have fallen along the wayside, that's excellent. We'll be able to use them to assess some of their blood values, and establish some of their health parameters. And we collect that, you know, using gloves the whole time. We don't want to get sick. We don't want to contaminate the samples, anything like that. So using gloves, being very safe, always working in pairs, because if Corolla comes trudging out at you, <laughs> that might be bad, as well as going over all of these cliffs and rocky slopes and wet beaches and everything. It's dangerous to go alone, so always working in pairs for safety. We've got all that information, do we just leave? No, we set up a camera. Uh, we've got a trail camera, same thing that a hunter would use uh, just to see if there are any animals in the area. Strap it to a rock. We're usually pretty far away from areas that the public go to, but just to be careful, we usually want to disguise the camera a bit. So we strap it to a rock or a branch or something. If it's a wide enough entrance to the burrow, we can even fit it into the burrow, which is the ideal, but then you might have issues of like clogging up the entrance or exit for the Kuroi or uh, they just get spooked by it because they now have something in the burrow. So it's kind of different for each one. You have to judge, okay, how well hidden can we have it and still have a good picture and not interfere with the penguins. So uh, it's a little different for each one, but we set up that camera, strap it onto the rock or the log, whatever we can, give it a bit of camouflage so no one notices it if they happen to be walking by and set it up to take pictures anytime and see someone walking by. So we've got a bunch of pictures of me as I'm setting it up, but hopefully after that, it's just a bunch of Corora coming in and out of it burrows. So that's what it means to go on a penguin survey. And that's what we've been doing, getting all that data ready. And then later in the season, we're going to be able to record, oh, the chick is walking out of the burrow. The chick has lost all of this downy feathers and it's starting to get his waterproof feathers. And based on that, we can tell the age. We can tell uh, how much it's related between parental attendance and the age that the chick leaves at. Um, what time of the year they're leaving at is a good indicator of how well the parents have been attending to them. If the chicks haven't been fed super well or they were incubated very slowly, it could affect their health. And based on parental attendance, how often there's a parent sitting on the eggs or sitting on the chick, it gives us a lot of information on how they're behaving in different ways that their health is impacted. So this is all giving us really great information and frankly some really cool pictures and videos. And uh, yeah, this is the sort of field trip we do. So hope you guys enjoyed this. Hopefully there are some cool videos and pictures and information, and as usual, send me any questions you have.